Our topic today is about a war on, on seniors' income and how to arm them properly. And the speaker is a very special person in that he's a dear friend of mine. I've known Chris for th over 30 years. In fact, people always ask me who manages your money. A significant part of it's with Chris. I know Chris. I trust Chris. He's a terrific money manager. We met back in the 70s when I was at Colonial Funds that was with Chris, which is now Columbia Funds. And he's been managing money since those days. Um, I, I, his, his bio will speak, he'll speak for himself as we go along. But I just say he's, he's a terrific manager with a wealth of experience. And I want to start off for the sake of time and get to this whole thing, because Chris calls it a war on seniors. And I'm wondering, Chris, if, if, first of all, if you could tell us a bit about yourself, and then tell us why you consider it a war on seniors. Introduce yourself and hi to everybody first, please. Thanks, Don, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, let me just give you a quick background. Uh, I started as an oil and gas analyst uh, in the late 60s at State Street Bank in Boston, so if you hear that accent, you'll know where it comes from. Uh, I didn't really start to run money until 1972. Uh, it was a great year in the market. Uh, I remember it well, and uh, I came home to my wife, and I said, you know, this is going to be an easy business, and you want to talk about getting a dose of humility. I sure as heck got it in 73 and 74. And I think, you know, having managed now through six recessions, you look back at that and say, those are the things that I think stand you in good stead, particularly uh, when markets are difficult. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, when you can achieve good returns for clients in tough markets, you really win the game. Uh, both of my kids are in the investment business, and their, their charge to me has always been, don't blow me up so I can uh, so I can market and I can go out and do what I do best uh, just make sure that you know I don't have to be there trying to patch up for for stuff that goes wrong and that's kind of been our moniker really uh, on what we've done over the last uh, uh, 10 12 years uh, in you know anybody who looks at our website or anything will see that you know we were up in 2002 we were up in 2008 we were up in 2011 um, you know we'll see how this year closes but uh, you know we continue to roll along uh, and I'm and I'm happy with what I see uh, maybe I'll give you a little quick five cent forecast at some point but Don's absolutely right about one thing and that is there is a real war on seniors and savers and retirees and the interesting part and the part that I really like from a client perspective and myself as a chief investment officer from an investment perspective we've got 11,000 people a day retiring a lot of them are modest means. It's always great to have people you know, retiring with five, ten, or you know, pick a number. Uh, the best thing, I think, is the fact that it's a huge market, and it's just not going to be surrounded by any one firm or you know, a, a few hundred people. It's going to be a lot broader than that. 11,000 people a day is a lot, and it continues onward uh, uh, for the next seven years anyway. I mean, if you look at the baby boomers uh, as they come of age, uh, so I think it's a real uh, potential. And the, and the interesting thing, and I've traveled throughout the U.S. and even in Europe, and the one thing that people tell me is, other than they don't want to you know, see the downside that happened in 2008, is that they need to have some sustainable income. And that, to me, is the critical part of what we do. Boy, I'll tell you, when they get out there and they take a look at CDs, money market funds, treasury bills, long bond funds, whatever the case might be, they're looking at it, and particularly in the, in the shorter-term money market instruments, they're getting next to nothing. And, and I really mean that. I mean, obviously, even in Europe, they, they even have negative interest rates. So you've you got to look at it and say to yourself, um, how can I have people – feel comfortable with what they do because once you have them in that type of an environment where their comfort level is high, where you know the volatility of what you have, the variability is low, I think you're going a long way towards uh, winning the game. And you know, it's interesting, I mentioned that uh, we had uh, uh, what is uh, uh, a, an environment that uh, uh, was negative interest rates, but um, I don't um, um, have any uh, real confidence that it's going to be higher interest rates at any point in time. And I feel that um, if you were to look at, say, Germany or you were to look at any of these European uh, countries, uh, you would see that 
they are going to continue with negative interest rates. They're going to continue with their quantitative easing, and it's going to be really difficult. In the U.S., Janet Yellen, she has even said very clearly, yeah, we may get to 1% yield uh, at the end of 2017. So um, if you don't think there's a war out there, I, I'm telling you it is, it is really something, and I just put a slide there to show you uh, what's happening. The problem is that people who have savings, they're going to outlive them or they're going to be in a situation where they say, oh, my goodness, you know, what do I do in order to, uh, to, to be able to maintain the same lifestyle? So, you know, that's really what my, uh, my main thrust of what we do uh, is. Well, let me um – I, I, make, I derive a lot of my income by doing client events. I speak at client events a lot. And I spend a lot of time with retirees. <clears throat> I live in a retirement community as I use Sarasota, Florida. The, the dilemma, of, not, the, as I see it, maybe you can pick it up from here. I know a lot of 85-year-olds, as do you. These people retired 20 years ago. <clears throat> the mean income 20 years ago is probably less than $35,000 a year in this, in this country. These people never expected to pay $75 or $80 a gas up their cars. Or, and I know people, as you do, I have friends making $4,000 a month paying $25 a month for medicine. So if someone comes to it, so I, if someone sees that and says, okay, these, you know, these guys were wealthy when they retired, they retired and, and women, they retired on fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year when the mean income is maybe $32,000. And they say, well, we've got a maid. And of course, 20 years later, they're still alive and kicking, and they don't have a maid anymore. So if today's client of typical advisor listing goes to the client, the advisor and says, look, I don't want to retire on 50000 I want to retire on 100 The advisor has to say to the client, a la Nick Murray, if you retire at 65 and live to be 90, prices will triple. So if you want to retire on 100 you need, and your income is not going to go up after you retire, <clears throat> you need the wherewithal to generate eventually $300,000 in income because to ignore inflation, to ignore the world. Right, Chris? So exactly. If, if, you, if you say to somebody, you've got zero interest rates, but you need the firepower to generate $300,000. It becomes impossible. I mean, even at 5%, $300,000 is $6 million. Now, most clients, if, if you, we, all, we all know, don't dream about custom yachts and homes in Napa Valley. People just want to be comfortable. They don't want to have to decide between food and prescription medicine. They don't want to outlive their money. They certainly don't want to be a burden to their wives or their husbands or their children. They just want to get by. So how do you say to somebody, well, you have to have $6 million? No, that's, that's, that's crazy. What do you say to them? And, and, the, and the thing that, about it is that they all have a memory, and their memory of, of 10 years ago when the, you were getting, you know, you could get 6%. 20 years ago, you could get probably 8 or 9%. And 30 years ago, they were making 12 13%. That's yes, I have a memory. mailing from that's 1987, a Putnam Ginny May Plus Trust mailing in 1987. It's an 1122 yield. A <laughs> <laughs> Ginny May Plus Trust back in 87. Don't they wish it could be now? And well, they forget the pain. To do the problem is, is, remember the pain of high interest rates? That's what no one talks about either, the pain of getting there. High interest rates are painful. Correct. And, and even though it will be a slow process, that's exactly what is going to happen. And the hardest thing is for those people that are invested in long bonds, nobody seems to remember that between 1966 and 1982, for 16 years, you lost money consistently every year by owning long bonds. And uh, that same, you may not have the same dramatic part, but the percentage change from 25 basis points, which, you know, is the Fed's rate now, uh, to 1% is, you know, that's huge. It's, it's basically a tripling. So, you know, you're looking at a situation where um, it's, it's going to be an uncomfortable period of time. And what we're trying to do is say, hey, let's have something that you can, point out to them this is a way to ease your way through that and when you know markets are better and whatever I think sure you know you, you might have an opportunity to invest in things uh, you know that yielding equities or whatever but look at the equity markets now I mean they're extremely narrow other than a couple of you know forgiveness stocks and and biotechs which you know anybody 55 to 85 doesn't want to invest in or maybe social media. Uh, other than that, it's a very narrow market. So there's been no way to really make money. In fact, if anything, it's been a stealth bear market. And yeah. the one thing... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
the one thing that I would say more than anything else is that uh, people say, well, it's low inflation or it's deflation or disinflation, and I say, I don't buy that for a second, and, and I can prove it to you. I mean, you can sit down after this call and you can think about it. Sure, oil is down, gasoline prices are down. That may help people a little if they're you know, going out Christmas shopping or if they're you know, looking for, you know, fill up their car and then save a little bit and spend it on a restaurant. Sure, fine. But when you look at the service part of the business, it is absolutely stunning to see what's gone up in price. I mean, if you happen to have, you know, lawn care or pool care, what you would in the South, even go into a Starbucks, if you, you know, we could go pay for parking or you just go to the grocery store for meat or veggies or if you are, um, you know, hire a plumber or electrician. I mean, I can go down the list. It, it's absolutely stunning to see which prices have gone up. It's almost everywhere, and there's just been very few exceptions, and those exceptions have really been uh, uh, energy-related more than anything else. So yeah, I think you've got to understand that you're in a <coughs> really interesting environment where it's going to be tough to get your clients through there. So if you were an advisor today, Chris, what would you tell them? Yes. And I say that you need to have to shoot for a 5% income, a 5% in income. You need to find those investments that are oriented towards a 5% in income. And I think, you know, if you, if you, if you look at it, um, people, you know, who have a lot of money, if you, if you have a client that's five, six million, as Don said, okay, you know, that meets the threshold. They're just interested in staying rich. They're not interested in getting rich, richer. And investors with modest means, even clients that are 500,000, uh, 900,000, you know, they can't afford any drawdowns. So you have to find those things that will give you that 5% yield number. And the hardest thing to do is how do you get that to have low volatility? It's one thing to go out there and say, okay, well, you know, I found uh, um, this MLP that gives me uh, 8%. Well, it doesn't do you any good if it falls from 40 to 20 uh, or worse. You need to have a diversified group that gives you that the type of yield where you can not only have uh, as low a volatility as possible, as low a variability as possible, but you also need to have uh, the the understanding that will give you the yield that you need. Now, nothing's guaranteed. It isn't necessarily going to mean that, oh, well, you know, uh, it's not going to go up and down at all. I, that's almost impossible unless you own treasury bills, which, you know, will give you like nine, ten basis points. So um, you have to understand that. But But very low and during tough periods of time, people flock into it. That's why I pointed out 2002, 2011, 2008, whatever the case might be. So I think that that's, that's the magic yield number that I think you can do realistically. If you look for 7%, um, you're probably going to be taking too much risk and you run the risk of, of having a drawdown for the clients. Uh, and if you are only offering them something that's a little bit better, say, than a money market fund, which you know is around 1% or less, uh, then that isn't enough to get them through. So this war on senior savers and retirees is, is just becoming an extremely difficult. And anybody who thinks Fed policy is going to take yields on treasuries back to 4 to 5%, say the long-term average is, is approximately 4.5%, that's going to take years and years. No politician running for office is going to turn around and say, "Hey, I'm, elect me. I'm going to bring you higher rates." So, you know, I think that that's the uh, uh, overall tenor of what I see, and the reason why, you know, we have, in essence, what I call a yield product that is close to five percent or five percent uh, for the ETF product that. Uh, we have uh, that that will assure that uh, they receive that in yield. How do you? I mean, what, how do you? If you go out today, look for five percent. Where are you going to look? Well, I I think you you need to find that pathway, and the pathway to me is fold in you know in general terms, and I'll give you specifics too. It's you have to be willing to do something that I never would have done 10 years ago, which is you've got to go anywhere and everywhere. It has to be multi-sector, and you have to look for things that consistently give you somewhere around 
250 to 300 basis points spread over treasuries and you say to yourself well you know what do i need to do in order to get there how do you put together a portfolio like that there's really it's not like that it's uh, some complicated sophisticated quantitative uh, way of looking at things sure there's a lot of research that goes into it but what we want to look at is what I consider to be spreads over treasuries. I'll give you an example. If you looked at the lowest quality of investment grade bonds, BAA, you can find things that are, you know, a little bit above four percent, four and a quarter, four and a half, you could put some of that in there. If for example you were to look at the the MLP space, if you buy a huge diversified portfolio, something like AMLP, you will find that you're getting you know, actually fairly decent yields, you know, 7% or so. And if you look at the volatility of it over the last, uh, even with oil falling, over the last uh, three or four weeks, you'll see, hey, you know, it really hasn't budged very much, and I'm getting a pretty good yield for it. Uh, uh, another area to look at is certainly in the high-yield bonds that are outside the energy patch. One of the things that we do with our ETF is we parse through all those loans that may be uh, uncomfortable for, for uh, investors because they could fall off the table. Uh, uh, and of course, we don't want that in the portfolio. So, uh, you know, that's that's what what counts. And I think from a mathematical point of view, even if the market falls off some, and you and you have a portfolio full of things that are yielding four, five, six, and even seven percent, you've got a cushion in there of of income. It doesn't do you any good, as Don pointed out, if you have you know a ten-year treasury at two point two percent. And the yields go up to two and a half or three percent at some point, which they could in the ten-year treasury. Uh, you, you will find out that you're underwater quite a bit in it, and there's no cushion from the yield that you get. So you, you've got to make the math work for you. Uh, and even if it's down real hard, like 2008, uh, you can see that by having the liquidity of owning things, which we do, that mature in six, twelve, eighteen months. Once the market looks at those, they realize, oh, yeah, I'm going to get my money back on those. And they tend to snap back. Anyone who looks at what the last two weeks of November and all of December, what happened with you know short maturity bonds in 2008, which we were uh, – you know, I think fortunate enough to have and have good positions in and even bought more, you'll see that they came ripping back over that period of time. And that's the reason why I like the idea of having things that uh, people can get a livable yield off. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of talk about this for some reason. You know, there's very little talk about it. And what amazes me is that people seem to forget that um, in a cons when we're looking for conservative income, conservative income with growth, I'm looking for to, to collect yield of one to one and a quarter percent per per quarter. And everything that I have is slated in that four four to six percent range. Lately, it's been actually a little bit higher. I've gotten some things that are closer to seven percent and with the same quality standards that I have. And that makes it even better. Uh, so th that's really um, the goal that we have. One of the questions I often get is, well, what happens if, you know, it looks like we're getting in a recession and the Fed says, oh boy, you know, we're going to have another QE or we're going to even go Europe's way and, and have negative interest rates, which I don't think they do, but they could. Everybody profits from that. What we have in the portfolios would, would, would all go up in that type of a situation. The only thing that they wouldn't go up in is, is if you had, you know, a real rip-roaring 2008 liquidity crisis and or recession, and then that is becomes more difficult. Um, but that's the reason why we always maintain liquidity, to try to take advantage of those those areas. And I mentioned an example uh, recently of the MLP space. AMLP, it doesn't produce a K-1, so you don't have that complaint. And, but now, you know, it wasn't very attractive when it was yielding five and a half, but it's attractive when it's yielding seven. So we we continue to look at that uh, as something that is really valuable. Often I'm also asked, well, why is the war on senior savers? Uh, you know, what, what, what do they don't like about savers? It's the one area that they can reach out and pay off every mistakes that they made, and they're still doing it. 
and this really penalizes the people who have tried to put aside their money, which is why, how do you win the game? How do you get back at them? And this certainly is the way to do it. And I say this worldwide. I say this for Europe. I say it for Asia, Australia, whatever the case might be, um, even South America. So, you know, my view is that this is the type of way you can you can win the game on it. And and even though it when you get through describing it, people say, well, I, you know, where's the buzz? Where's the excitement? That's exactly what it's just the opposite of. It's not exciting. This is something you can put them into and say, okay, you feel comfortable with that. And then you can go and you can take a look at something that, you know, might be even a little bit more uh, ebullient for them, a little bit more exciting. But the use of when I say uh, go anywhere, it, it doesn't mean that we're locked into one single area, that we have to buy just U.S. bonds. We can buy anything from munis to structured notes. And one of the things that I'm really warming up to is emerging markets. I'm not talking about a debt that would be from a country uh, like a Venezuela or, 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 or that type of all. I'm talking about an emerging market debt where there's actually the wherewithal to pay it off. Although we haven't ventured over there, at some point, Brazil is going to be really cheap enough to buy. Uh, at some point, you're going to see an opportunity in areas uh, like uh, the paper that comes out of Hong Kong, paper that comes out of Singapore, that's been priced down because of the Chinese uh, volatility. So um, go anywhere is a key to what we have. And always make sure there's a spread over treasuries. Uh, even if you were to buy an equity, you want to see where you can get, you know, a spread. Uh, like, I, I laugh because, you know, we, you know, we start off by saying, can you hear me now? It sounded like an old AT&T ad, but AT&T with a 5.5% yield, those would be one of the few types of things that you can actually own that gives you that. And, and What's AT&T? Is it going to be out of business in three years? Absolutely not. Will they raise their dividends slightly? Sure they will. So you could even put a little smattering in there of that. But mainly, you want to concentrate on achieving that 5% magic yield number uh, by what I consider to be spread products over, uh, uh, over treasuries and lots of different sectors. Chris, why is... Um you keep saying 5%. Why is that the magic number? Because I think, Don, if you stretch for more than that, uh, it becomes really difficult. I would be happy as could be to see interest rates start to bounce back up. It would be wonderful to see treasuries at 4.5%. I'd go buy them now. Uh, and just as you stated earlier, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, or you quoted what the government uh, fund was, uh, you know, back in uh, uh, the late 80s. Yeah, yeah it, it, you know, that's fine then when you see that the capability to have that type of yield. But right now, I think anything more than that is tough to get. Now, as I said, I've been in an awful lot of places and talked to, you know, many advisors and presentations to their clients and whatever. And what kind of surprised me is I said, oh, boy, you know, they're going to come up and say, hey, I, I can't get by unless you get me 7, 8, 9 percent. But almost to a person, they say, I'll take 5 percent as long as I don't, you know, have a huge drawdown. I'll take 5 percent. And that's, to me, kind of a magic number. Um, and you can't always get there with what you have for the products, but we're that's why I said four to six percent uh, per year is kind of the, what I'm looking at. But five percent now, I think, is doable. And and looking at one to one and a quarter, I want one and a half percent uh, per quarter, and not not uh, uh, you know uh, have uh, the volatility uh, that's big. We have a little slide just kind of that shows it. You know, you go into uh, a yogurt shop or an ice cream shop and. Uh, you know, the whole idea of this is a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and lots of different flavors. I think if you looked at the portfolios, you, you might be surprised. You might say, well, I bought some senior loans, or, you know, uh, yeah, I, I bought some of these uh, 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 structured note type situations, and, and but but combining them all together and having them in a broad panoply makes to me, so much sense. And I'm surprised we haven't seen, you know, other people look at that because we've been doing this now for the better part uh, of 11 years. And uh, I think in increasingly you're going to see more people do this. You have to diversify it away because not everything works for you all the time. And uh, you, you have to be aware of that. 
uh, you just have to uh, uh, understand that not every uh, product that has uh, somewhere between four or six percent and everybody jumps out to a product they want to sell you and this to me is about preserving the clients by having uh, a ton of those types of products in what we have. You know, let me ask you this, because this the elephant in the room. You know, you buy a speed trap on the highway, you slow down, even though no one chases you, because there might be another one. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a couple of devastating bear markets in the last dozen years. And the, I, I find a pall out there, it's like a P-A-L-L -L as I go around, that people are sort of waiting for the next, there's always the next one. What happens if we have a 2008, with your theory? Uh, well, I think that... Uh, that's what everybody's uh, mind, I think. To yeah, some extent. Yeah, yeah, no one is the same. Um, certainly, if you look at the um, ex excitement from what I consider to be the weak hands and the bubble boys, um, it, it looked a little bit like late 1999 and 2000, but that was a totally different type of sector. That was a sector that basically had, you know, made up sales and no earnings and, uh, um, you know, valuations that were I infinite. Now I think it's just on the high side of things. So, uh, but let's assume we do have a, a hard drawdown. Let's assume we have you know 20, 20, 25 percent. What's going to get murdered is the people who own equities, and in particular the equities that everybody seems to be gravitating towards because they're the only ones that have made people money. And it's sort of a, a, a damned if you do, damned if you don't. You put people in these because they come in and they say, well, this is what I want because it's the only thing that's going up. And they wind up by being biotechs so or they wind up, uh, uh, you know, social media stocks. And th that's a very difficult situation because when the market corrects, they will correct very hard. In fact, I think that anybody who stood here uh, you know, five months ago and said, I, I just have a utility portfolio. And all of a sudden, you know, the end of January, early February, you know, they're looking at it and say, at that time it was only yielding like three and a half percent for them. And then, wow, they wake up at the end of June and, and they've lost 11% of their money. That's what, you know, you know, our whole goal is to avoid that. You're hitting a major issue. <clears throat> you mentioned before people 55 to 85 especially the upper end yes. of that, those people believed and they got screwed. That whole, you believe for years you could buy stock, stocks and real estate and retire comfortably. And now these people are stuck in houses too big for them. <laughs> They've got no yields. <laughs> Market's been hammered a couple times. And they're, they're, they're crazy. They're going crazy about things. Because they really That's believe, right. we all believe for years. You buy stock, you buy real estate, you're fine. Uh, and that's, that's a lot right. of the case. And and I, you know uh, everybody has a forecast, and uh, you know I think that you know you beware of experts. Uh, certainly take them with a grain of salt. Mine is that you know it's pretty simple. I think that um, the world isn't coming to an end. I don't see a recession in the U.S. I mean, at least it hasn't started. I looked at this whole earnings last earnings season. I think it's a push. You know, and, uh, you know it's about uh, you know there's a. Mm, 55% of them, you know, were, were were basically winners as far as the bottom line is concerned. Probably uh, as far as the the, the uh, um, their sales were concerned, increasing it. And then you had maybe 40% uh, uh, that beat it on the earnings side, um, and you know, sort of back and forth as far as that's concerned. So as I said, a wash, a push. And uh, however. Uh, I think that um, if you were to look at the next three or four years unfold with the valuations that we have in the market, I think it'll be hard pressed to do 5% a year. Even yesterday, Goldman Sachs, and I uh, uh, tend to look at it to say now, um, they're not trying to short these things, are they? Uh, said that, you know, we'll probably be lucky if we do 3 or 4% over the next three years. And I said, yeah, I, I kind of agree with that uh, in the market. And, uh, you know, just like your analogy of the people that have, you know, tied up, uh, you know, their money in these homes and then they can't get their money out of it because, you know, the prices drop and everything. If we have a portfolio that's constructed with ETFs, with um, uh, various areas where we can get um, uh, yields, uh, and I mentioned, you know, repos, structured notes, senior loans, uh, um, hedged, 
uh, fixed income, uh, and I can go through these areas, I, I think you have enough diversification. So when the market decides, and it could, it could start right now. I'd like to see a healthy correction. As I say, these, these bubble boys, I'd like to see them get trapped. Um, this is going to fare an awful lot better. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, um, you know, take a look at a bank. Take a look at senior loans. Let's see what happens there. Banks can raise interest rate on your loans as interest rates rise. We all know that. And say you get a senior loan and it's you know four and a quarter percent. They're they're not quite at five percent. I wish they were. Well, uh, the bank has already done the credit work for you. And there's a high probability that the company, even if the market drops 20%, that that company isn't immediately going to go out of business. Obviously, if it, at all what you're doing, it won't. They're usually to what I consider to be mid-sized companies, 10 to $20 billion companies. Uh, and you're going to get these loans paid back, and you're going to collect that income from it. And the volatility of that investment will be much lower than if you own the stock or the equity of that company, even if it had a good dividend. No. The, uh, I, I, I want to continue to stress that the biggest and fastest growing new market for advisors is truly the baby boomers. I bet if you looked around for most advisors and said, you know, how many of them here are, uh, uh, you know, how many of my new clients are clients that might be a 35-year-old internet millionaire or something like that? Ah, there's a few. Uh, it's really uh, people who are retirees or pre-retirees, and they're represented by what I consider in that statistics, that's 11,000 people per day retiring, and certainly those people that are thinking of retiring in the next five uh, to seven years. And, and even beyond that, I mean, if you have somebody who's you know 50, they're still thinking, okay, well, you know, I, I want to do something. I want to be able to put something aside, and it's so tough to do. Uh, and if e even at five percent in a in a twenty five basis points world can make a difference for them. Yeah. Yes, it can. So this is the, you do it. This is what you look you're looking at right here. Absolutely, and the way we do it with the structures that we have, uh, it's interesting because if you were to take a look at uh, say, who, who else does this? You will see that um, uh, that if you saw pension funds, large institutions, foundations, I used to run foundations like the Meyer Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, uh, I ran the endowment for the University of uh, Illinois and whatever uh, in, in the past. And, and you look at what they've done, they've all gra starting to gravitate towards this because they need to have that type of cash flow and they need to be able to say, look, this makes an awful lot of sense for um, uh, what we want to look at on a long-term basis. And people who look over the next three to five years, I think they have to look hard at what these big guys are doing. Now, some of the foundations and endowments uh, that went off and, and got too far into private equity or, or just too much into small cap or too much into emerging markets got burned. But those that have stayed with what I previously said, the high yield, senior loans, structured notes, uh, uh, CD, Yankee CDs, reverse repos, have all done pretty well. And I just think that that environment is going to continue. What's your takeaway, Chris, from all this? What would you like to take away from everybody listening here today? I think what you need to do is you need to look at more particularly what, um, obviously what we do, and you can look at it from, you know, one of our ETFs. You can look at a real low volatility one like a MINK, M-I-N-C, or you can look at something where you're getting 5% in it on the dot, NFLT, uh, which is a, a ETF that, that basically consists of everything that I've talked about today. I think you need to look at those and understand that these are things that I, I call them client savers because they don't, won't blow you up. And you can go out there and you can sell other things as, that are necessary, some that you know maybe uh, uh, more lucrative from a, from a uh, uh, an income point of view, whatever the case might be. 
and that that should be the core. That should be the foundation of what you do. Somebody steps out to you and says, look, I'm just retired from an automobile company and uh, I've worked in it 30 years. I got 1.2 million. A big part of what they have should be in what we uh, are investing in, and that's the way to do it through uh, global financial private capital and through those ETFs that I mentioned. I didn't spend much time with Mink, but I would say you that that's an even more conservative uh, side of, of uh, a multi-sector world where the yield may only be 2.7 or 2.8%, but take a look at what it's done as far as variability over the, over the last six months uh, when the market has trended off a little, you'll find it's very stable. And this is what I feel is the right investments for this new class of seniors and savers and pre-retirees that we're getting. That's great advice. I got another question for you, Chris. When Fox News calls you, how much notice do they give you? <laughs> You're always on Bloomberg. They like call you. You get five minutes. You get a week. How much time do you get? Uh, I, usually, I get a day. And of course, <laughs> you know those 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 companies always want some type of a of a story. They always want you to mention some stocks and or what they would like is more aggressive uh, uh, names as far as ETFs are current, uh, concerned. Like you know, cyber securities. You talk about hack which is you know the ETF that encompasses that or s bio for emerging uh, um, biotechnology companies so they're interested in having that because it's sound bites and it's an additional story for them uh, it's interesting to see how pe different people change uh, doing the Bloomberg Asia and uh, basically feeling that the Fed will raise rates this year and then watch, you know, the very next week somebody comes on and says, ah, it's not going to happen until 2016. So, you know, uh, that's why I kind of say beware of experts. Concentrate on something like, you know, what what we do. I've learned over the years, you know, these, you know, forecasting, uh, it tends to be a fool's errand. Uh, and get what you can get right now. And if interest rates should go up over a period of time, we'll be able to, you know, soon achieve for them 6% or 7%. Uh, if they were to climb up uh, 150 basis points from here, because we're always looking for that spread over treasuries. That's great stuff. Rebecca, do we have any questions for Chris? Yes, we actually <clears throat> excuse me, have a few questions. Um, Jeff B. asks, what about the counter argument, Chris, that so many people have been in income type portfolios and they've missed a tremendous bull market, now, for those that have been in equity-oriented portfolios and are nervous, maybe they need to have some cushion. So it sounds like there's really two questions. The first one is, what about those that have missed the bull market that wanted income? And then what about those that have been in an equity-oriented portfolio and they're nervous that maybe they need to have some cushion going into this market? Um, uh, for two great questions or, or or two parts of a great question the first one if you've missed the bull market um, it, it's like you know you you can't you can't cry over the spilt milk I would just say okay uh, they got one but I can be patient we're already seeing what I consider to be a, um, a stealth correction in the market and there's some areas that are down substantially they won't necessarily stay down substantially forever. I'll give you an example of it is the large uh, oil companies, the Exxons and Chevrons and Mobiles and Total Petroleums and whatever. Their yields are starting to look very attractive. So you can sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to take advantage. Yeah, I missed the first turn when it happened in March of 2009, but I'm just going to sit here and wait for these fools to come my way. That way you can feel good about your investments and you can take advantage of it. But if you'd missed it, you know, trying to go play catch up is a just an automatic sure way to lose money. It's called compounding error. You know, you in, you're in something that doesn't work, and then you invest in something that you think is going to work, and then that doesn't work. That's the worst thing that can happen as an investor. And I think for the people who have, you know, uh, income portfolios, I would say that even more importantly to stay the course, to diversify, what we do is, as I said, multi-sector and we go anywhere. Uh, that's true. For those that have just concentrated on equity income, and by that I'm talking about the stocks like uh, Johnson & Johnson and Kimberly Clark and Philip Morris's and whatever, certainly they've shown that they can be 
good performance over a period of time. But also look at and to see how long sometimes you have to wait. I'll bet if you anyone who goes back and takes a look at the price of Coca Cola in 1996 and take a look at the price today, you'll say, guess what? It's forty dollars. It hasn't moved any. Uh, you really made no money other than the dim, the dividend. The only way to make money in Coca-Cola was to buy it when two CEOs died. So, you know, just saying, well, I'm going to invest in equity income because it's going to help me out over a period of time. I think you'll find that these large multinational companies are out of gas. There's no more new markets. They're already in Sri Lanka. They're in. Uh, 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 Myanmar, you know, they're they're in Namibia. You, you pick the place, Mongolia. They're already there, and it's very hard for them to continue to grow their businesses. So that's a great question. We have a few more too, and that was a great answer. Um, one is, and actually, this looks like another two-part question from Jim. How long has your income portfolio been around? And what kind of volatility have you experienced with that income portfolio over the past several years? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would di direct them to take a look at uh, everything we have is on the Global Financial uh, Private Capital website. But to answer them real quickly, since 2002 uh, and um, uh, actually since the end of 2001, we set it up just so to – uh, for the purposes of uh, what I consider to be was really volatile markets at that point in time. I think people remember that. Uh, and I think that if you looked at the volatility, you'll find that uh, um, it's, you know, there's nothing that's completely stable, but it's pretty good. If you looked at 2008, you'd see probably if you looked at month to month, you'd say, oh, they were down like, uh, you know, almost 8% at the end of October, but we got back above even by the end of the year because, you know, employing it, as I said, in in uh, multi-sector fixed income made an awful lot of sense and it had a huge rebound. So um, some some volatility, but but versus a lot of other investments, uh, not so. So around since, uh, two, record since 2002, and I would say for the amount of income it collected, it would, our aim is to make it as low a volatility as possible. And if you were to invest in something like Mink, you'll see, you know, you, very low volatility. That's only been around for you know uh, uh, two and a half years. Okay. Um, someone else asked, where do I get more information on your portfolios? Uh, what is the website address they would go to? Um, they could go to um, a Global Financial uh, a Private Capital, uh, and it's uh, I think our website address is. Uh, uh, gfpc.com should be able to uh, um, enable them to get uh, to where they need to go, uh, and the, that information is all there uh, on on the site as far as our uh, um, you know anything that they need. And I think that uh, uh, you might see it at the uh, it says yeah gf-pc.com. It's on the uh, you know, on the slide that I think that's showing right now at the very bottom in the fine print. Oh, and of course, they can always contact us and we can give them that information as well. Absolutely. 